you to open up your Bibles to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2 is where we'll be this morning. We'll be starting in about verse 10 and uh, read down to the end of the chapter. Man, it is good to be back at Hickory Grove Baptist Church. Very thankful for it. Uh, thank the Lord. Very thankful. God has given us uh, such good preachers. Mike Powers did a tremendous job. I watched all of the services and uh, did a great job. Very thankful for his leadership. He is now uh, on vacation. He and Kane Direct on vacation. And uh, actually, I don't know where. He said, don't call me. I'll call you. So he's gone. <laughs> A lot of you have asked about uh, my son, Mac. He is recovering well. The kindness of the Lord has protected that young man's life. And I'm very thankful for that. And thank you for praying for him. He's doing good. And uh, you can pray for his parents. If we can just survive him getting to adulthood, adulthood, I'm very thankful. Also want to uh, just thank you as a church for praying for and supporting Camp Paradise and also Centric Kid the week before. We slammed those two camps together and both of them went really well. I was at Camp Paradise last week all the way up till Friday night. And just to have uh, our guys leading it so well, Jacob and Ben providing such great leadership, and then all of the family group leaders, Brian Davis wrote the curriculum, our guys uh, led in the worship. And so it, it really was a great display of Hickory Grove working together as a church. And I want you to pray for our students. Pray that God would grip their hearts, that we have young men and women that will love Christ above all. Now, as we think in that direction, I'm going to turn your attention to 2 Peter. That's where we are today, and this is a difficult passage. I'd like to call your attention to verse 10. I'm going to start about middle way through the verse, because that's when the thought starts and we'll read down to verse 22. If you found that, why don't you stand? We'll read together God's Word. 2 Peter chapter 2, starting in about the middle of verse 10 to verse 22. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of our God stands forever. Let's begin verse 10. About false teachers. Bold and willful... They do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, these false teachers, these like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, Blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, they will be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong is a wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression by a speechless donkey, spoke with a human voice, and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For, speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first." For it would, ha it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness 
than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to his own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Now, let's all pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you for your word. We trust this is written for our edification, and for our growth. We pray by your spirit you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. What a chapter to come back to after vacation. I mean, what we've just read is not a very enjoyable chapter to read. It's not the kind of chapter that's really any fun to preach. But not all the medicine we take tastes good. God knows our need, and if there ever was a time in the history of the church to point out and expose false teaching, that time is now. But you've got to ask the question when you read this chapter, why? Why, why is it here? I mean, it's a lot about false teaching. Why did Peter write it? Why has Peter spent so much time on false teachers? I mean, it's a whole chapter. In fact, we started it last Sunday, false teaching. Mike was real excited about that last Sunday. And then this Sunday, we may even spill into next Sunday. So I've been thinking about that. Why did Peter spend so much time here? I think Peter spends all this time on false teachers primarily because Peter was a pastor. And as a pastor, he's held responsible for feeding the sheep. What I mean is for making sure that his people get a steady diet of God's Word. And as a pastor, it is infuriating to find out that your people are being poisoned by lust and by materialism and by the prosperity gospel that's masquerading as Christianity. So, so chapter 2 is a warning. Chapter 1 was written with... Um, with great encouragement. Chapter 1 is written, when you read it, you have Peter there uh, encouraging us to confirm our own calling and election, to make sure that we are saved. To, it has a real positive feel, chapter 1 does. But chapter 2, Peter's giving the same message, but with a more dark and somber tone. I mean, that's what it is. It's a warning. And this warning is designed to make us serious. It, I mean, a warning is here to say, hey, you, you need to be serious about following Jesus Christ. And the main point of this chapter is telling us that those false teachers, I mean, you can see it in the chapter, especially when you get to the end, false teachers and People that follow and listen to false teachers, the end of the chapter, they end up condemned. This is more than just a matter of opinion. And so what I want to do this morning in the time we have together, I want to convince you. I want to convince you to know the gospel and love the gospel and cling to the gospel and go to the cross of Jesus and stay at the cross of Jesus and know that Christ is everything. So let's uh, tell you what let's do before I get cranked up and try not to sweat so early in the sermon. <laughs> let's look, let, let's look and just go through it. Let's look at the lessons and trust God's Word, and that this chapter is here for us to be built up. 
Let's look at the traits, the traits of a false teacher. Here's the first one, number one, if you like to uh, write things down. A false teacher is reckless, reckless. Write that word reckless. When I say reckless, I mean not careful, not, not humble, but reckless. You see it right there in verses 10 and 11. Pay attention to verse 10 and 11. Let me uh, start right in the middle of verse 10. That little phrase, bold, they're bold and willful. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Talking about angels right there. As they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them in front of or before the Lord. The phrase, verse 10, bold and willful. They don't tremble when they say things that even the angels wouldn't say. The false teacher has a, a reckless daring that defies God, that, that has this determination to please himself at all costs. It's a manipulation, you see. It's not just a forsaking. It's taking the truth and manipulating it. It's a, it's a manipulation of the truth. It's an ensmalling. When I say ensmalling, I mean making small. It is an ensmalling of God. Let me tell you what a false teacher won't ever be accused of. A false teacher won't ever be accused of saying God is bigger than he actually is. False teacher is not going to magnify the name of Christ. A false teacher is trying to bring God smaller, saying God is smaller than he really is. A false teacher will proudly say that God's primary concern is not his own glory, but your comfort. That's what a false teacher will say. A false teacher will say that... Um, a false teacher will diminish the cross. He will elevate. False teacher is elevating coolness so that reverence for God and love for His grace and hatred for sin are diminished, and all of that is diminished in the name of hoping that you have a better week this week at work. That is not the primary cause of the gospel to make you have a better week this week at work. I hope you do. But more than that, I hope that your life will reflect the glory of God as you pursue a relationship with Jesus Christ. False teacher never really addresses the real issue. The real issue that separates you as a sinner False teacher is not going to address the real issue that separates you as a sinner, separating you from God, a God that is holy. And brothers and sisters, we must reject that heresy out of hand. As a Bible-believing church clinging to the cross, we reject that stuff. Recklessness. Let me give you another one to consider. A false teacher not only is reckless, a false teacher is carnal. Carnal, C-E-R-N-A-L, carnal. I couldn't think of a better word, carnal. It has the feel of worldly. Uh, worldliness is a society that is, it is functioning without God. And as I read the warning in verses 12 and 13, uh, look at Peter's warning in verse 12 and 13. And see the description. Let me read it to you. Verse 12. But these, talking about false teachers, these like irrational animals, irrational animals, creatures of instinct, 
born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant. They will be destroyed in their own destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. Man, what a description. And what you have here in verse 12 and 13 is a description of, of crass materialism. Materialism. Verse 12 and 13, Peter launches in, into an all-out attack of false teachers. He says in verse 12 there, uh, do, do you see the, or he calls them, they're like animals. They're instinctual. And like animals who were created by God to be hunted and eaten or hunted and destroyed, he says, that, that's what's going to happen to them. They'll be hunted and destroyed like animals. I'm not making this up. You read it. And, and their mistake, that's what Peter says, the false teacher's mistake is to confuse this is where people get trapped. To confuse the thrill of animal instinct with the presence of the Holy Spirit. To confuse what it's like to just react thinking that's the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let me just talk about the Holy Spirit just for a moment since it's been brought up. The presence of the Holy Spirit does not cause you to act like an animal. The presence of the Holy Spirit does not demand that you act in a, an irrational fashion. The presence of the Holy Spirit does not manifest itself in ways that are not described in the Bible. The presence of the Holy Spirit causes you to worship King Jesus. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't act like a crazy man. You worship King Jesus to live for King Jesus. That's where we've got to make sure when we're reading the Bible, we understand that Christianity is a religion of the Spirit. God fills us with His Spirit, but we are governed by a book. And God's commands serve as, as guardrails on the highway of life to keep us from running off the road. God's commands serve as a, a hedge around a garden of grace that keep us in the garden of grace. You know, Christianity, Christianity is inescapably ethical. Here's what, what I mean by that is that Christianity plays itself out, not just at church on Sundays and we're getting knowledge from the Bible and hoping to grow in good doctrine, understanding the deep things of the Lord, but Christianity plays itself out in how you live. And you know a man or a woman is filled with the Holy Spirit, not from ecstatic utterances on Sunday, but holy living on Monday. You, you cannot have a relationship with a good God without becoming a better man. If you have a relationship with a good God, you become a better woman. Do not claim to have a relationship with a good God and you still act like the world. I mean, that's what the false teacher, verse 12, they are zoe physica. They are irrational animals. How does an irrational animal function? That irrational animal functions, operates on feelings and desires. I want it, so I get it. That's how an animal operates. An animal operates on feelings and desires instead of Scripture, and reason, and the Holy Spirit. And here's what Peter says. They act like that, well, that's what they're going to get. I mean, this, this is what he's saying. I'm trying to preach it in the Spirit. Peter wrote it. They'll get the fate of animals. They will reap what they sow. And in verse 13, when you get to verse 13, verse 13 has us as, as false teachers are taking part in the church. 
I mean, the, the wording in verse 13 there are blots and blemishes. You see it? Blots and blemishes. Jude, who sounds a lot like Peter, Jude says that they are hidden reefs at love feast. A hidden reef, a ship is coming over the ocean and a reef is underneath, you can't see it, and it tears the bottom out. It goes on to say, they stain and defile the church. So why do we spend the time here? Last Sunday, this Sunday, um, it looks like next Sunday. By the way, I did not intend, you know, when you lay out a... <laughs> I'm going to preach 2 Peter, it's going to take me 11 weeks, it looks like it may take 12. And uh, this week's, I've never wanted to be back in Genesis so bad that I, that I have studying this week. <laughs> but they, 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 they stain, I mean the wording is terrible, they, a false teacher will stain the church. That's why it's important for us to stand and see, make sure that we are discerning. Hey, look, those are two bad points. The third one, it only gets worse. I didn't know how to say it, and so I'll just say it like this. Number three, a false teacher is twisted, twisted. And I didn't write this down on the screen, but, but I would probably put in parentheses under it, and what I'm talking about is, is sexuality. I want to be careful here, but when Peter takes, when Peter gets into verse 14, Peter's description in verse 14 takes this sort of really dark turn. Does it in verse 14, and it's very similar, you can look down in verse 18. In fact, let's do what let's do. Let's read those two verses. I'll read verse 14, and then I'll drop down and read verse 18 and see the similarities, and let's, let's talk about it a moment. Verse 14. <clears throat> Talking about false teachers, they, verse 14, they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. And then he stamps this, accursed children. Drop down verse 18, please. Verse 18. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice. See the word again? They entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. So you have unsteady, barely escaping. See it? They are being enticed. The word enticed uh, twice, for, verse 14 and 18, it's the idea of a fisherman with a hook and puts bait on it, puts it in the water, and waits on a hungry fish to come by and go after it. Verse 14, Peter says that their eyes are full of adultery. It's important to look at that language now. We see it in English, but written in Greek, it's really vivid. In fact, it's vivid and arresting. You want to look and say, is that, is that in the Bible? Well, what he's saying is, this false teacher looks, looks at every woman as an object, looks at a woman as a potential candidate for sexual sin. This, this insatiability. Or, or this, this insatiability for things of the flesh, you find in, in verse 14 and verse 18, and here's what they do. This is where I, I want to drive it to. They seduce the unsteady or unstable. Verse 14, called unsteady souls. Verse 18, those who are barely escaping. And those two descriptors, verse 14 and verse 18, they speak about the same kind of person. Somebody that is vulnerable. A false teacher preys on people that are vulnerable. When I say vulnerable, I mean those that have, that are unstable, unsteady, barely hanging on. Those that have not been rightly discipled. Look, people are unstable, maybe even in this church. 
People that are unstable, they are unstable because they've not planted their feet firmly in Christ. Honestly, it's why we do what we do. It's why, um, it's why Kyle Scarlett leads our children's ministry like he does with a heavy basis on the Bible. Why? Because it's so important for our children. The number one thing that is going to plant a child's feet in Christ is not just when he or she gives her life or his life to Jesus, it's when he starts being discipled and grows. It's why we try our best with our students to give them solid biblical truth from the beginning. It's why new Christians, you come to church and you give your life to Jesus, it's why it's so important for new Christians to be taught solid basics. Why? So that your eyes get trained and you're able to spot some slick false teacher from a mile away. You won't be duped into their curse. Curse, I use the word curse because that's the word that Peter uses in verse 14. Notice what he calls them at the very end of verse 14. He says that they are accursed children. That, that they are cursed. Here's what he means. That as teachers that are false teachers, not teaching the true gospel, they rest under the curse of God. As do all people who fail to trust in Christ. When Paul writes about this, he says that, that without Christ, we are children of wrath. Sometimes we think that, that people without Christ are just sort of neutral. Nobody's neutral. Without Christ, we are children of wrath. That means that we are born into this world. We live our lives under the condemnation of God. That is a terrible umbrella to live under. You, look, you won't hear a false teacher spend much time on sexual ethics. You're not going to hear a false teacher talk very much about God's design for marriage. You're not going to hear a false teacher that's going to point to the biblical or orthodox position on gender. You're not going to hear a false teacher talk about that much. Why? Because he's twisting, you see. Twisting the clear teaching of the Bible. It's dangerous territory to be in. It's a dangerous church to go to or so-called church to go to that doesn't point you to the Bible in this weird state of affairs that we found ourselves in. Let me tell you why. I'll give you a fourth thing to consider. It's because, number four, a false teacher is off-center. Used to be on center, but now it's off-center. To be off-center, you know where center is, but you've drifted, drifted. I'm not sure where I, where I get this. It's in verses 15 and 16. In verse 15 and 16, uh, Peter goes back to the Old Testament. He's already used Noah and Lot. Now he brings up Balaam. Balaam um, is a strange Old Testament figure. He's the false prophet uh, found in Numbers 22. Uh, he, was, he was prophesying for money, and he was so spiritually obtuse that the donkey, remember, remember the story? The donkey that he's riding on had more sense than him and spoke to him. People have said that is not the first time that the Lord has spoken through a donkey. Watch how Peter uses the story. Let me read it to you, verse 15 and 16. So here, here's the comparison. Get, get the comparison. False teachers are like Balaam. They've abandoned the way. The way is Christianity. That's how it was described in the New Testament and right here in verse 15 and 16. Forsaking the right way. I think Peter is talking about the way. That's the way the New Testament would call Christianity. Forsaking the right way, they've gone astray. 
They followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Right there in verse 15, on the screen you can see it in your Bible. The right way. You know, you know what that implies? <clears throat> That implies that at some point early on in a false teacher's life, a false teacher doesn't start out sounding false, but begins slowly, maybe even imperceptibly, to drift from the way. And once you drift from the way, you get overtaken by a desire for gain, more. I'll tell you the truth, it's, it's tough to be a popular, it's tough to be a popular preacher preaching an unpopular gospel. The, the, very seldom do you find the two go together, a popular preaching, that preacher that's preaching the unpopular true gospel. Why? Because it's off-putting. It's not very popular to call people sinners. Call people sinners, they tend not to come back to your church. But if they'll stay long enough to hear me say, sinners in need of a Savior. It's not popular to preach the cross. Why? As the Bible says, the cross is a stumbling block. It, it's foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those whom God has called, Christ is the power for salvation. It's so very easy to move off center. Like Balaam in Numbers 22, that's what Peter's talking about. Like Balaam. Balaam was a preacher. Balaam sounded like a preacher. He used preacher language. He had the preacher wording. Balaam was a preacher. He used preacher language, but he had a devil's heart. I actually have three more points, and I've got to decide this week whether or not I'm going to come back to this passage. I never dreamed I'd be spending three weeks in it. Because verse 19, uh, because verse 19 through 22, it's a, it's a pretty heavy passage, and I don't want to just go flying by. It deserves to be looked at. But before we go there, maybe next week, let me just see if I can end with this. A false teacher, false teacher is empty, empty, empty. You, you can read verse 17, you see what I mean? You have there verse 17, uh, Peter uses two brilliant metaphors to give us the idea of what a false teacher is like, verse 17. Let me read them. Talking about a false teacher, he says, they are waterless springs. They are mists, that's the first metaphor. They are mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. Look at, look at verse 17. Look at the first metaphor, waterless spring. In the intense heat of the Middle East, when the sun beats in the middle of the day. You've been wandering in the desert and you come to a location where somebody told you that there was a spring there. So in that oasis, you walk through the oasis and you get there to the middle of it, and there it's obvious a well has been built around this spring. You drop the bucket down hoping to get some cool water. You pull the bucket up, and, and all that's in it is sand. You see, a false teacher promises satisfaction for weary, thirsty souls, but only leaves them more and more parched. You can't deliver what you promise. Remember what Jesus said to the woman when she came to the well? Remember that? Remember that? 
That woman who was so thirsty, she had tried everything. She had all these lovers and husbands. She had tried everything. And he talked to her about her life and about who he is. And John chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, listen to what he says. Everyone who drinks of this water, the water here at the well and the water you've been drinking your whole life, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. You see, the water that I will give you, woman, the water that I will give you will come in you like a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And so, so the call then is to, to come to Jesus and drink. This is how Jesus said it. If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And here's, here, here's how you drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, from his inmost being will flow rivers of living water. Will you hear the true teacher who is Christ, who calls you to come and drink his perfect life, his atoning death, his beautiful resurrection, all for sinners that they might be saved. Will you join me as we pray together? With your heads bowed this morning as we go to the Lord in a time of commitment and prayer. We've taken a hard passage and used it to point you to Jesus Christ, the true teacher, the true savior, the true water. And this morning, as we will sing in a few moments, I'll invite you to come and drink of Christ. Have your soul satisfied with a longing. Have your soul, your parched soul, filled with the water of everlasting life. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you give us hearts that believe. Lord, I pray for men and women here that have been confused over time, that you would clearly call them. And Father, we pray that their eyes would look to the cross of Christ. We thank you for salvation. We pray you would extend it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand, please, as we sing together?